Hello everyone and welcome to this video in which we will talk about independence key square test. We are in the chapter bivariate statistics. That means that we are crossing two variables, so two characters that have been studied inside a population. On each individual, two information are taken and then crossed in the table. So um, the formatting of the key square test is made for contingency tables, that means crossed tables. Well, um, the question is, are variables dependent? Are they related to each other, uh, numerically speaking, of course, not cause and effect relationship here? And to answer this kind of question, we have to um, use a tool that does exist for approximately one century, which is a very, very common used tool in statistics, the independence chi-square test. As you can see, chi-square refers to a Greek letter, chi, that could be written C-H-I, chi-square test. That is its name. So what is the purpose of this test? So, as you can see here, you can uh, test a hypothesis of independence um, between two variables, and our goal is to try to reject this independence and say, no, they are related. What is the global tool, the global mean to test this independence? Is to calculate the difference between observed and average theoretical values by a global parameter, a chi-square, calculated chi-square. Um, as you can see, um, chi-square is in fact a number that is calculated. What kind of number? Uh, it's some kind of distance between what you have observed in your sample, okay, taken in the population, and what you can think on average in the population, if really the hypothesis of independence were true. So let's take an example and um, follow this example from the beginning to the end of the test. So your first hypothesis of independence is named H0, it's denoted H0, and uh, it's named null hypothesis, okay? It's your basic hypothesis. And it will always be a hypothesis of independence. So let's think about uh, gender and IQ. Our question is, in a population, do um, male and female have the same distribution of IQs? Okay, so um, your first hypothesis it is that gender and IQ are independent. That means that uh, men and women share the same IQs. Okay, the same distribution. We will try to reject this hypothesis thanks to results obtained from a sample. This is the only way we can test a hypothesis. Taking a sample in the population, test this sample, and try to extrapolate to the population. So, Let's take a sample, which is very little here, but that doesn't matter here for our example. Um, doesn't matter for the method. Eight men and 12 women have been tested with an IQ test. And here are the results, very simply displayed here. Um, only people who had a result less than 100 and people who had a result more than 100. Um, female, also I, I put a F H uh, in French, femme, homme, okay, so women, men, three under 100 and nine above it, and um, or over 100, and six and two for the distribution of men. So, no, um, no uh, quick conclusion about that, okay, it's just a sample and uh, sampling fluctuation does exist uh, from any population. So our question is, uh, what this kind of sample that shows differences between men and women, 
um, likely or not so likely from a population where gender and IQ are independent. So we have to compare this sample to an average theoretical sample that could have been obtained in such a population. And we have to be able to build this average theoretical sample. Um, if you want to build such an, a sample, you want uh, also to compare it to your sample. And if you want to compare it, this sample must have the same um, subtotals and the same general total as your sample. Okay, they must share these values. But what are the values to put inside? Well, if gender and IQ are independent in the population, the average theoretical sample will show the same distribution of IQs for women and for men. But, of course, there is not the same total of women than men. So, um, this distribution must be equal to this one in proportion to the total. Well, as a conclusion, you have to build a proportion table here. This will be your average sample coming from your H0 population. How to fill a proportion sample by cross products? Of course, this is the best way to do it. So, for instance, for its value, it will be 11 times 8 divided by 20. For the value on the top left, 9 times 12 over 20, and so on. The result will be these ones. The fact that there exist decimals is not a problem for us, even if we're talking about number of people, because it's an average sample. Okay, so uh, these are average numbers. So taking every possible sample into account. Now we have to compare both. And this is at this point that the chi square uh, will be implied and then calculated. A chi square is actually a distance between observed values and theoretical expected values on average. A distance calculated uh, with the language of chi-square. And the language of chi-square asks us to calculate this. You have to square the difference between an observed and a theoretical value and to divide the result by the theoretical value. And as you can see, you have to make it four times here because you've got four couples of values, 3 and 5.4, 9 and 6.6, and so on. The first calculation that will lead to a result on the top left will be then 3 minus 5.4 squared divided by 5.4. And you have to repeat this calculation with 9 and 6.6, 6 and 3.6, 6 and, and 2 and 4.4. The results are these ones, okay? So you've got partial chi squares here for each couple of value or of values, and you have to sum these four chi squares, partial chi squares, to obtain a total chi square that will be the expression of our chi square calculated okay calculated chi square so you just calculated the distance between the first table and the second one or you can say chart the first chart and the second one this distance is expressed not in meters of course but in a scale of chi square distribution Okay, um, if you modify the first sample, there will be another distance from the second one, and so an other value of chi square, and so on, and so on. Our goal is to know uh, to 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 know whether this distance is considered very big or not. If it's considered very big, you will say that um, maybe you were not unlucky with your sample that doesn't reflect the population but maybe that this ID on the population is wrong 
and then that this average sample is not the true average sample of your population because h0 is wrong okay so uh, as a conclusion if k squared calculated is considered big enough you will be allowed to reject h0 so let's have a quick overview on the k squared distribution okay you only uh, can see one value of k squared but there is a possibility an infinite number of possibilities of distribution of k squared values uh, depending on um, the sample that has been taken as an example so this quick overview will tell you first that uh, there are a lot of possibilities of k square values and that behind that there exists a k square distribution that is a probability distribution just like a normal distribution or student distribution it's a continuous probability distribution what is the shape of the curve okay the graph of a k square distribution well it looks like that in general um, not for any uh, purpose but in general what does it say to us it says that if h0 is true okay you will find a, ma a majority of samples that lead to a weak value of k square not exactly zero because uh, you would have to obtain a sample that is exactly the average theoretical sample which is impossible in general because there are decimals in the numbers but low values of k squares are likely so you've got here high probability densities but um, samples that are far away from the average theoretical sample are um, not very likely okay so the probability and the probability density here tends to zero as uh, the k square tends to infinity so i'm talking about infinity of course you you can't have a, an infinite distance between both tables uh, but uh, k square is a continuous probability distribution so uh, it's based on values um, on r, r plus okay so zero to infinity well our 4.85 can be located in a k square distribution okay because it's been created it's defined and the k square distribution can tell you that in your case there were 97 percent approximately of samples that would have um, given less than 4.85 k square values and only 2.77 percent samples that could lead to a value more than 4.85 so you can see here that your sample is a bit weird um, if you take h0 into account uh, to be true okay well <clears throat> in fact you won't have access to this precise information as percentages um, the truth is that um, test in statistics, okay, a hypothesis test, uh, is associated to a significance level. What is that? It's a percentage that is taken as a limit. And the most commonly used percentages are 1%, 2%, 5%, and 10%, mostly 1 and 5%. Your only goal is to know whether your 4.85 is over a limit of 5% or of 1%, it depends on the first choice, and not precisely 2.77%. So, in an exercise, you can calculate your k square, of course, and hopefully 4.85, but you don't know. Um, not, not yet the exact percentages that correspond to the probability to be less and the probability to be over or to be more than so your possibilities will depend on what is given to you in a chart okay a probability 
uh, a key square probability distribution table. And uh, in this kind of table, you will find four values corresponding to the four percentages I given to you a minute ago. And uh, you will be able to read 6.64, 5.41, 3.84 and 2.71, corresponding to the percentages 1%, 2%, 5%, and 10%. What does it mean? It means that in your situation, in your exercise, 1% of the samples would have led to a key square more than 6.64, and so on. Okay, 10% uh, of samples uh, would have a pain key squared more than 2.71. And as you can see, your sample with a key square of 4.85 is located between um, the limits of 2% and 5%. You can name the key square that correspond limit key squares. So you know that uh, your sample belongs to uh, the between 2% and 5% of samples that uh, share big key squares. Okay, but it's enough for an independence key score test because a significance level will have been chosen at the beginning of an exercise of a test if you're talking about uh, <coughs> about real life and let's say that a significance level of five percent has been chosen if it is the case your sample is over the limit the corresponding limit of 3.84 that means that your sample belongs to the 5% of high key square samples. What does it mean? It means that you will be allowed to reject H0 by telling that your sample um, has a key square that is very big compared to the majority of other samples. So it's weird as a situation if H0 were true and uh, it's not impossible, okay, but it's weird, so you can reject H0. But if you reject H0 which, with such a sample, you are taking at maximum 5% risk to be wrong, okay? So, um, in fact, you've got a, a real value of 2.77%, so you know here that you are taking 2.77% risk to be wrong if you decide to reject H0. But you don't have access to this information uh, in the first time if you only compare your value to the limit points here, 1, 2, 5, and 10%. So it's not a problem. Um, the name of this 5% is the significance level of the test. And by the way, the name of your real 2.77% is named the p-value of your test. Okay, um, So the, the correct percentage that is over your key square of 4.85. P-value and significance level uh, don't make any confusion between both. Okay, uh, If you are performing a test okay, uh, to say yes or no, you are taking into account a significance level. Well, there would be a lot to say um, on key square distributions. Uh, where do they come from? Um, they come from normal distributions, standard normal distributions. Um, standard normal distribution and key square distributions are related to the student distribution. So uh, I would have to make uh, um, further videos for that. Okay, I won't talk about that here. I'm only talking about the method of independence key square test. Sorry for the little noise here. Um, so uh, let's go back to our test and our example. We, in the first step, calculated our key square 4.85. Then we had to compare it to limit key squares that are given in the table. There are four values commonly given okay, for the four percentages significance level commonly, commonly uh, given and commonly used. Um, uh, with the chosen significance level, you've got one limit key square. If your calculated key square is more than the limit key square, you can reject H0. 
because you're sure enough uh, to reject it. You will take less than the significance level risk to be wrong by rejecting H0. Um, if your key square is less than the limit key square, it would be the case here with a significance level of 2%, for instance, you are not sure enough to reject H0 because you would take more than 2% risk to be wrong by rejecting H0. So your conclusion in this case uh, would be uh, not to reject H0, but be careful, not rejecting H0 doesn't mean at all accepting H0. Okay. Um, if you have less than 98% chance that tomorrow it will snow, I won't make you conclude that tomorrow it won't snow. Okay. Uh, it's just that you're not sure enough that it will snow. Okay. So you don't uh, you mustn't make uh, the inverse conclusion, okay? In uh, the end of a test in statistics, you've got two possibilities. You reject the first hypothesis or you are not sure enough to reject it. So you don't say anything. Uh, you just write, I don't reject. That's all. I don't know. Well, <clears throat> What does this key square load table look like? Um, it looks like this kind of table, okay? The kind of chart that corresponds to um, a right row to read and a right column. So if your significance level is chosen at 5%, you know the right column to read. But which row? As you can notice here, there are 6.64, 5.41, and so on in the first row. And I choose in my previous slide these values and not the second row or the third row and so on. Why the first? Because it depends to degrees of freedom, DOF. And degrees of freedom depends on the shape and the size of your initial chart data set. Okay. Well, uh, let's have a look to that, and I'm going back in my slides here. My data series was given with two rows and two columns, three, nine, and six, two. That's the same size for the second table or chart, and the same size for the partial key square chart. Okay. So whatever the table or the chart you're, you, that you're looking, uh, it will be the same reasoning. If you want to know the number of degrees of freedom in a table, you have to uh, eliminate one row and one column and count the remaining cells. So in this little table, the remaining cells is only the first one. So you've got one degree of freedom. Why freedom? Because if you are looking for values in a table that is empty, but if you are um, choosing uh, in advance, okay, the subtotals, 12, 8, and 9, 11, yes, you've got a freedom to choose the first value. Maybe it could be a 3 or a 4 or a 5 or a 1. Okay, you've got several choices. But once this first value is chosen, the three other <coughs> um, are, are blocked, okay, because of the subtotals, of course. So if it's a four, you have to be an eight here, and a five here, and then a three here. That's all. So you've got only one degree of freedom in your chart to begin your chart. And in any situation, whatever the number of rows and of columns, you can choose with a certain freedom um, some values until the last column and the last row, where the subtotals uh, are blocking uh, the last value to be given. So, in any case, if you remove the last row and the last column of your initial chart, 
And if you count the cells that remain, you've got your number of degrees of freedom of the table. So now let's go forward again and, and have a look here. With one degree of freedom, and for example, a significance level of 5%, your limit chi-square is 3.84. And then you will be able to compare this limit chi-square to your calculated chi-square, okay? Well, <clears throat> I'm displaying now um, at the bottom of the slide some additional comments uh, that you can take, but th that won't be useful for us here right now in our chapter. Okay, that's additional comments um, that talks about uh, values of chi-square if you uh, take into account a number of degrees of freedom that is more than 30. Um, the limit chi-squares evaluate thanks to that, where the coefficient u is the standard normal low coefficient taken in this table, for instance. Well, let's forget about that. The chart here is the most important for us. Okay, let's now have a um, quick overview at what we've done and at the conclusion uh, to our example. So, um, catch a glimpse about that. Well, our goal is to test the null hypothesis of independence, always independence at the beginning. And our aim is to try to reject it. Can we afford rejecting it or can't we? For that, we calculated first our chi-square coming from our sample and the comparison between our sample and the average theoretical sample taking H0 into account. So created by, um, by cross products uh, to form a proportion table. Now we have to evaluate our chi-square in comparison to other chi-squares that are given by the chi-square Low table. Well, you have to know your number of degrees of freedom, and I just put here a little formula that helps us to calculate it. If you take the number of rows of your initial table, minus one, and if you multiply it by the number of columns, minus one, you will have the number of remaining cells if you remove the last row and the last column. Okay, your uh, form now, your chi-square load table, will give you four possible limit chi-squares uh, corresponding to four chosen significance levels. That are the most commonly used significance levels. So once you know the significance level of your example, it will give you one limit chi-square. And then, if your calculated chi-square is more than the limit chi-square, you can reject H0 with this significance level. If not, you can't reject H0, and that's all. In the next video, we will see examples and exercises on that. Of course, we have to perform some exercises, and then um, we will begin with exercise 1 of our document. We will see that later we will be able to conclude any independence chi-square testing um, and you will see that the formatting of the test is always the same. It's, it's unique, okay? So you will be used to that. I hope so, at least. Well, bye and thanks to having followed this video.